I was a really powerful manifester and a great manifestation teacher when I was working neck up. Like it works, neurochemistry works. This, once you get into your body, it's just a way to supercharge it. It's a way to yes. amplify it because then you have like your heart, right? Which we know the electromagnetic field of the heart is 70 times more powerful than that of the mind. Absolutely. And then the hoo-ha, right? Then you've got a whole dif different cocktail of bliss chemicals. You've got the oxytocin, the norepinephrine, the adrenaline, all available to you to supercharge the manifestation or the dream. So for me, embodiment is taking it out of the intellect, out of the theoretical, and actually feeling it viscerally in your cells. Peace and riches, blessings. I am Michael B. Beck with the host of Take Back Your Mind. Richest blessings to all of you and welcome to Take Back Your Mind. We always begin our program with a life question of the week. And after this particular life question, I'll be introducing you to my friend, Emily Fletcher. You're going to love our conversation, I'm sure. Today, the question is coming from Chad. Chad is from Los Angeles. He writes, I have recently gone through a breakup. We were best friends, lovers, we also did sound ceremonies together. Our intention now is to evolve into a deep friendship and continue working together. The thing is, my partner broke our relationship agreements multiple times by being unfaithful. And in turn, the trust was deeply compromised. How can we move through this and rebuild the trust while saving their friendship and our ceremonial work? I truly envision the possibility of us still working together, but at the same time, I feel deeply hurt and betrayed by her. Thank you, Chad, for this question. I think that it covers the gamut for many people who have, are in different stages of the relationships. First of all, betrayal is one of the most difficult things to forgive. It is easy to forgive someone that you don't know, someone that's an acquaintance that may have done something to you or said something about you or gossiped about you. But when you're in a, an intimate relationship, you're in a friendship, you're in a, an intimate partnership, and someone betrays that trust, that's a little bit more difficult than regular forgiveness. However, it is necessary. If you're seeking to still do ceremonial work together or to have some modicum of friendship, then you must go to the depth of your being and actually forgive this individual. Now, that's one. One is forgiveness. And as I said, betrayal is difficult to forgive because someone that you knew closely uh, lied or broke an agreement. So that means you might need some assistance or you may not, but you're going to have to sit that push person in front of you. I'm talking about uh, in your mind, in your heart, and say to them in substance, what you did cannot determine my happiness or my destiny. I cut the emotional strings where you are concerned. I forgive you. I forgive me. Meaning all forgiveness is self-forgiveness. So one is forgiveness. Two, you cannot entertain any fantasies about getting back with this individual. A part of you may be longing for that relationship again, but she's already showed you multiple times that she's not built right now for a monogamous relationship. So don't have any fantasies about getting back with her. That, so both of these things are up to you. One, forgiveness. Two, no fantasies about the relationship. Now, if you can really do that, then perhaps you can enter back into some type of ceremonial work together because you won't be fantasizing, fantasizing about being with her or thinking or calling being with her the good old days, because they weren't the good old days. Because obviously you had one form of relationship in your mind and she had another. I'm th if it's a she, you didn't say whether, you just said you were best friends and lovers, but you didn't say, it. and it doesn't matter. Regardless, it doesn't matter. So to move forward, deep, profound forgiveness to 
no fantasies about being with her. If you cannot be with her without fantasizing about being back with her, do not go forward with the ceremonial business aspect of your, of your relationship. It's just going to cause you more heartache, more anxiety, more worry, and you will not be able to do, go to the depth of your forgiveness together. If you do forgive, you don't fantasize this possibility for, for friendship, this possibility for working together. But she's already showed you she doesn't want monogamy. I hope that helps you, Chad. Now, for, for those of you who are listening, I hope that assisted you as well. But if you're seeking spiritual insight and around, around finances, health, life purpose, email me at podcast at michaelbeckwith.com. Say your first name, state your question, and as in this particular case, universal enough so that it helps other people when you're asking the questions. Have a bright day. We're coming right up now with Emily Fletcher. Peace and blessings, everyone, and welcome to the podcast, Take Back Your Mind, where we are making ourselves available to the awareness that we have a mind, but we're not our mind. And oftentimes the mind is programmed with all kinds of fallacies, superstitious thoughts, beliefs, all kinds of ways that our mind has been imprinted by misinterpretation of experiences. But we want to take back our mind so that it becomes an avenue of awareness for that which is real and eternal, that which is true about us. So our life can come under the law of that which is real and the progressive universe, which is seeking to support us, can absolutely bring all the good that our heart is available to Guess what? I have Emily Fletcher with us today. She is the founder of Ziva, the host of the Spine Tingling New Podcast. Why isn't everyone doing this? We're going to get to the bottom of this. She's an international speaker whose superpower is making esoter esoteric tools accessible to mainstream audiences, reaching over 50,000 people, teaching over 50,000 people meditation and manifesting her best-selling book, Stress Less, Accomplish More, debuted at number seven out, out of all the books on Amazon and has been translated into 12 languages. Her work has been featured in New York Times, Good Morning America, and in Vogue. She's taught at Apple, Google, and Harvard, Harvard Business School, a formerly stressed Broadway performer going gray at 27. Emily was desperate for a solution and she found meditation, which immediately cured her insomnia and her anxiety. Her transformation was so dramatic that she quit acting and went to India and studied the ancient tools Ziva students swear by today. Over the past three years, she has dedicated herself to developing innovative embodiment practices. I love the word embodiment, by the way, that empower individuals to transmute stress into boundless joy. Welcome, Emily. Oh, my goodness. Reverend Michael Bernard Beckwith, I am so happy to see you. I am so honored to be here. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate your presence, your smile, your glow. Listen, before we go into some of your, your work here, you have, and you're, you have a very exciting body of work, and some of it, some people would say taboo. I wouldn't. <laughs> catch up. Ca catch up our audience on what you've been doing these last 13 years. Yeah. So I you know, like you mentioned, I was on Broadway singing, dancing, acting, and thought that would make me happy. You know, from a little girl, I thought I'll be happy when I'm on Broadway. And right. I think we all have our version of that. I'll be happy when I get married, I get the job. And interestingly, three weeks after my Broadway debut was the saddest I had ever been. Because I realized at a pretty young age, I was more interested in the happiness of pursuit than I was the pursuit of happiness. But I didn't get that at 22. You know, it's just that next job, next boyfriend, next agent. I did that for 10 years and made myself sick in the process, stopped sleeping, going gray, getting sick, like you mentioned. And then I found this particular style of meditation. 
It cured my insomnia on the first mm. day. I stopped going gray. I didn't get sick for eight and a half years. I started enjoying my job again. And I thought, why isn't everyone doing this? Like, I'm like you, when I find something that works, I want to shout it from the rooftops. I don't want to keep things under wraps. I want to live in a world where everyone has access to these beautiful tools. And so I, I left Broadway, went to India, and I've been teaching meditation. And I'd say what I'm known for is almost framing meditation as a productivity tool, which is interesting now because I think- High the world performance, is, kind of. Yeah, high performance tool. Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, I've worked with Navy SEALs and athletes and NBA players and Fortune 100 CEOs. And, and interestingly, I was like, hey, here's this thing and it's going to help you make more money and have better sex. Because I was just like, I will just meet people where they are. I don't care why right. you start meditating. I just care that you start because good news, you're going to be nicer on the other side. Right, Absolutely. <laughs> And, um, and, and I feel really proud of, of the little dent in the universe that I've made through that. And now in the last three years, I found a new modality where I'm like, wait, why isn't everyone doing this? And so that's why I started the whole podcast. And uh, so I've just been in deep research and development mode of teaching people how to use their own internal bliss chemistry to manifest their wildest dreams, which is something that I am, I owe a deep debt of gratitude to you for really introducing that to me so many decades ago. So thank you. Thank you. And you have really, you've really taken off. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I look at uh, what you're doing with your life and your world, and you've taken those nuggets and actually embodied them and mm -hmm. are bringing them to so many people. So I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that you're out there doing the good work. Thank you. Also, yeah. can we just tell one funny story? Um, when I was like a teeny tiny baby meditation teacher. I think I had graduated literally like two or three weeks before. And my friend, Anthony Mindel was speaking at this big conference in LA. It was at like some beautiful big theater. You were on the bill. Eckhart Tolle was on the bill. And so I've just graduated and I'm, I get put right after you. And when I had respected you so much, admired you so much. And then that was the first time to my knowledge that you ever did a stand up comedy set. And so you did. Oh my God. I remember that. Yes. You did stand up and you crushed it. You were so good. And I was just back there cheering you on and then obviously you know a little intimidated my ego is like really wanting to prove and be like look how you know smart I am and I'm like oh my gosh I'm in the presence of, of greatness and then the funny part is the stage manager I was in the wings ready to go on and the stage manager goes go and I walk out on stage and then they started playing a movie like on top of my body like I was just standing in front of a movie projector I went out at the wrong time so I just started like a Miss America wave and I just walked off stage you know what I remember that <laughs> I remember that. That was you that went out that after me. me. I remember this. This is what was happening on that particular day. Um, the producer called me that, like a couple of days before. And he says, we don't want you to give a talk. We want you to do comedy. I thought he was joking. <laughs> I, I, even up to the, even up to the day I said, because uh, he said, no, J Jim Carrey, he's going to do the talk and you're going to do the comedy. Come so on, I thought that's... I thought it was a joke. So and, but you did so amazing. And you hadn't even, I thought you'd been working on that for months or something. No, it was that day. So that day I called him again on the way to the Saban Theater. And I said, come on now, you want me to do an evocation and do, you know, do a talk about meditation or about enlightenment or something? He says, no, Michael, I've seen you speak. You can, you can jump into the zone. I want, we want you to do comedy. We're going to have Jim do a talk. I said, okay. So, you, <laughs> so what I did was I read the newspaper the newspaper is full of funny stuff. I'm and, glad that you see it that way. That's a very, well, I mean, it's hilarious in terms of, it's in terms of the fact that we're cosmic beings and we get tied up in these knots of such littleness, such fear, such greed, such animosity, such separation. So it's more ironic humor, not like yes. funny, funny, but yeah. it's like, so I read some things in the newspaper, doctors doing experiments on taking feces out of human beings from healthy human beings and putting them into other human beings. Uh, there was all kinds of stuff that was hilarious to me. So that became my material. And I right. just, got up and just zoomed with it. <laughs> that was so good. And the other thing I remember from that night is that Eckhart Tolle, who was supposed to be the last speaker in the program, it just said, content will be determined in the now. And right. I was like, I'm not there yet, but one day I'm going to be brave enough to say, Emily Fletcher, content will be determined in the now. <laughs> because you know, like when you channel, it's hard to know what's going to come out. <laughs> Absolutely. As we, as we like to say, we never let our topics block what needs to be said in the moment. <laughs> mm, amen. Yeah. But anyway, I'm glad I'm glad to have you here. Thank you for that memory. I, that, that, yeah. was, that was I remember that. And you didn't know what happened after that. Um, I got invited to roast a friend of ours who's passed over now, 
uh, uh, Wong. Uh, she was a great com 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 uh, Korean comedian. And she wanted me to come roast her. Come on. And I said, no, no, you, 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 you're, you're doing your cancer treatments. You're doing this. Th what? Can I just come and just pray for you? And she said, no, if you don't roast me, I'm not letting you come. <laughs> so I went and roasted. I was the first one up. And I roasted her. I mean, I, I can still remember some of the jokes. And was she alive or she had passed? No, she point? was still alive. Wow. She was okay. Wink. It was a fundraiser. Wow. And I finished uh, roasting her. And um, what is the comedian's name? He's passed over. He, he was the one that talked about stuff all the time. And mm. people, oh God, he was a great comedian. He's passed over. But his daughter came up to me and asked me to be a part of their comedy group. <laughs> And I said, no, I'm running Agape. She says, yeah, but you can travel with us during the week. She said, your, your timing was so good. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think about it, it's like you spend enough time like letting source move through you, feeling into the audience. You know, you're such a master at that. And so, and I think once you start to understand that skill, it's like, well, then you, you change the source material, right? Like what's yeah. the desired impact? And you just, it's like, you're changing channels. So you're tuning your mastery to a different channel of the dial. Absolutely. That, mm -hmm. that was, and so then I became kind of known, like this guy could do comedy or whatever. You know, <laughs> the <this>. comic reverend. <laughs> yeah. The, but the thing about it is, you know, as human beings, we have to be humorous. We have to laugh at ourselves. Yeah. We can't take ourselves too seriously because in the macro, this is what's difficult for people. In the macro, there's no loss. There's no death. Mm. You know, we, we go through these intense experiences, but when we go through the macro, nothing's really changed in the universe. Nothing's really changed, I should say, in the eternal. Mm. And so we can poke fun at ourselves in order to have an opening to catch that inspiration and that insight. Yeah. And so my, 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 my question to throw back to you is we've just come back. We've come from a very intense period of time, you know, the pandemic. People are kind of, it's, it's affected their mental and emotional state. You know, how, how are you dealing with people during this time? I mean, you have mm -hmm. these wonderful practices. And I know you're finding that a lot of people are, are having some mental anguish, some fear, you know, yeah. some residue of this particular collective experience. Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing that comes to mind is that like during the actual, you know, when we were, you know, New York City lockdown, you know, doctors, nurses, EMT folks, like really stepping into the unknown. And so we, I'm very proud of the fact that we gave a million dollars in scholarships to Ziva online to first responders, because mm. the cool thing is that it's, it's a, it's a course in, in mindfulness, meditation and manifesting, but it, you could do it online. And, you know, still people learning meditation was oftentimes in person and it was so hard to gather, you know, so hard for people to learn face to face. So at least it was like a little bit of a lifeline. So that was the first thing. And I feel like, you know, COVID did not create a mental health crisis. We already had one and then it poured gasoline on it and made it very, um, more apparent. And it feels like to me, post COVID in this time, like, you know, just like there's been a K-shaped economic recovery where rich are getting richer and poor are getting poor. I'm seeing the same thing happening spiritually, where people who have had the privilege of having access to meditation and prayer and trauma work and therapy and shadow work, I'm seeing them popping off into very high states of consciousness very quickly, like having mm -hmm. real surges, um, which is sometimes can be destabilizing or exciting, depending on whether the, the support you have. But conversely, people who have not had the privilege of meditation and therapy and shadow work or medicine work, they are really plummeting into deeper depression, anxiety, sometimes suicidality. And that is something that I'm very much I'm looking to. Oh, this is my son, Jasper. Where's my blue ghost? Everyone, this is my son, Jasper. Who? My, hey Jasper, I, I touched your head when you and your mother were buddy, buddy, Reverend Beckwith is asking you a question. Can you say hello, Michael? Hi, hello, Michael. Do you know that he touched my belly when you were inside? He gave a blessing when you were inside my belly. And your blue ghosts are in the pantry on the right side by the squeezy. Which is right? Here. This one. Yep, you got it, buddy. I love you. <laughs> I you love know? it. I love it. <laughs> I love real life. <laughs> real life. <laughs> it's mom life. <laughs> Un that was Jasper, everybody. Unscripted reality. Jasper yeah. makes his appearance on the <laughs> Take Back Your Mind podcast. <laughs> yeah. So, so going back to the, the K-shaped recovery, you know, just like there's been an economic dividing that's getting stronger, I think the same thing is happening spiritually. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is how do we get the people who are on the upward trajectory empowered and equipped 
to help to bridge this gap, to help to close this divide. And not because one is better or worse than the other, but because living in a bifurcated society is not as fun as it would be to be in a more unified society. It's just yes. gonna be more enjoyable if we have more unity points with our fellow humans. And, and to see someone suffering, you know, it's hard to not then fall into your own suffering. And so that becomes its own challenge. And so that feels like an exciting, an exciting opportunity for those of us who have been in this work for a while, right? It's like, how do we empower people to not wait till they have the PhD in spirituality, to not wait until they're fully enlightened. But if you know A, teach A, you know B, teach B. And we just keep lifting each other up. And how, how do you describe a K-shaped recovery? What's your description of that? Hmm. Well, it just feels like that people who have been on a spiritual path are very much accelerating on their spiritual path. Yeah, yeah, and people that. who have not been on one are accelerating into so you call that depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like, it's just like a, it's the, yeah, the, the vectors are, or yes. the lines are separating further and right. further apart. Right. I got that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I didn't notice that uh, during that particular period of time at Agape, you know, we grew exponentially. Good. Uh, online classes, um, it just, I mean, s some communities shrunk, some even had to close mm -hmm. and ours just exponentially grew and, you yeah. know, it was already a pretty much a, um, a global community, but it just went just ridiculously, wonderfully big. So many people searched for us and, and found us. And as you say, at the same time, other people and communities, you know, went deep into depression, deep into a sense of separation, a sense of polarization, blame, shame, regret, things of that particular nature. Isolation. Isolation. You know, like if if yeah. your church only met in person and then that was shut down and you didn't have that right. community available to you. Some people, their community is their job, their, their coworkers. And if that wasn't available to you. And so, you know, isolation is a powerful it's a powerful drug. It's just the one that makes you sick, you know? Right, right, and, and so right. I'm just so grateful that, that the magnet and the beacon that you've been putting up was amplifying and that people could see that beacon of light in the darkness. Yeah. We were trying to code things like uh, being together at home, you yeah. know, in terms mm -hmm. of calling it isolation, we're, we're being in community, but we're in different parts of the world yeah. and, then, and then really uh, motivating people to practice some modicum, some modicum of practice. Yes. Uh, and I, I, I had, I asked the question, I had everyone ask the question, who do I want to be when this particular experience is over? Yeah. So that the mind starts to open up to possibility of change and transformation mm -hmm. rather than close itself down around fear and anxiousness. Yes. That's so yeah. brilliant. And, and I found that the, like, being in that question, right? Of like, at least you have some sort of a light on the end of the tunnel versus like, um, cause energy either creates or it destroys, right. right? And so you were helping people to move towards creation instead of into destruction. And the other thing that we all had in common is that to some degree, the entire population had a near death experience. You know, the entire population faced its own mortality in a way that hasn't certainly happened since I've been alive. I think, you know, in many decades, I feel like the whole world went through this near death experience. Yeah. And, you know, when my father got diagnosed with stage four cancer, he was willing to try some different modalities. He was all about the green juice, the energy machine and things that he never would have tried as like a Southern Baptist man. You know, he would have thought it was weird or too woo woo. And when he got a stage four diagnosis, he's like, give me all the green juice. Right. And I feel like, you know, now we're willing to sort of take a more potent medicine because we faced our own mortality in a different way. And I think also the severity of the depression, the anxiety, the isolation is, is opening people up to, mm -hmm. hey, I will do that breath work. Maybe I will go and see that shaman. Maybe I will actually face my un unfelt feelings for the first time. And so that feels like a real, um, a real possible blessing as we move through this of like, can I examine these traumas with more love um, because we know what happens when they're unexamined. Absolutely. I called it the Corona bonus. <laughs> that, so many people discovered vitamin, organic vitamin C and zinc and, and so uh -huh. many um, vitamins, minerals, health modalities, meditation, prayer, even though many people knew about it already, but like a whole slew of individuals were pushed into becoming interested in that. 
uh -huh. integra integrating that into their into their life and yes. realize they've been living life um without these modalities and without this proper nutrition for a long period of time yeah so yeah it was a i call it the corona bonus it, mm -hmm. it, and, and and i appreciate what you said too it's like the whole world went through something oftentimes it's relegated to a particular country when some yes. emergency happens there's a tsunami there's a flood there's a fire but this the whole world was swept into it to make us reveal that we're really all one you know mm -hmm. we, we really this is the earth is round there's no sides to it even though men like to draw forcible borders on it and say mind me mind me stick but, their flags in something yeah stick their <laughs> flags in the ground and be macho about it you know and then a normalized war and things of that particular nature but that created a common denominator for everyone to begin mm -hmm. to sneak up sneak into the realization that we really are one species you know there's mm -hmm. many many species on the planet and we have the human species and we need to begin to think differently and mm -hmm. act differently and behave differently did you say think differently think think act behave yes you know? yes and that feels like a real corona bonus too of yeah. like the unity that like wait we all did go through the same storm now admittedly some people are in yachts and some people are in rowboats right but we went through the same storm Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. tell me this, we're going to come back to that, you know, sacred sexuality. I saw this, uh, uh, it's interesting because I just did an intensive recently and that came up in my, my intensive. I, I did some work around that, but when you, how do you describe that? Mm, thanks that for asking. Part of your so, work. so yeah, so when I first found meditation, it was the first time I had that thought of like, ding, 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 ding. Like, oh my gosh, this is so good. This is the key that everyone's looking for. The thing we're all looking for, it's right inside. Why isn't everyone mm -hmm. doing this? And the second time I had this was about three years ago, you know, in the deep pandemic lockdown, my Corona bonus is that I actually got brave enough to um, move through a transition in my marriage. Mm -hmm. So sweet Jasper, who we just met, his dad, who's amazing, an amazing father, amazing man. Our relationship had come to a completion and we were ready to graduate from it. And so moving through that and then choosing my own sovereignty, like choosing myself, maybe for the first time in my life, which was terrifying and brave. And then there's a Glennon Doyle quote that says, the braver I am, the luckier I become. And mm, so it felt like, like just that. weeks after this brave sort of free fall into the unknown, nature started fire hosing me with this PhD in sacred sexuality. I met my best friend who's a world famous Tantra teacher, Layla Martin. I met this beautiful love who's still my love. Um, three years later, I lived, I moved in with Regina Thomashauer, AKA Mama Gina, who's been teaching mm -hmm you know, goddess practices and female empowerment for 30 years. And so it was like, okay, this is fun for me personally. Like, I'm like, thank you, nature. This is delightful. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't feel like it's just for my edification. This feels like nature's being like, hey, remember that thing you did for meditation, how you made it attractive and accessible? Do that thing for sacred sexuality. Because mm -hmm. with sexuality, we have not just curiosity, not just foreignness, which we had with meditation 16 years ago, um, we also have conditioning and shame and guilt yes. and programming that it's wrong and a bad and sin sinful. And so I knew that this was a bigger mountain to climb and, and it felt like I would need a lot of hands on deck, you know, that was going to be like, Hey, we're going to need a whole collective of people, like really helping to remind people of their own divinity. Cause to me, it's like nature gave us these tools. Nature gave us this internal pharmacology. Nature yeah. gave us the gift of feeling these states of ecstasy and joy and pleasure yes. inside of our bodies. Why on earth would nature give us something that is then a sin Simple. or bad? Right. right. <laughs> and, and so to me, the thing I get most excited about with sacred sexuality, which there's infinite, you know, incarnations and fractals of it. But the thing that I'm really lit up about is helping people to see that you can use your pleasure to pray. Mm -hmm. that you could actually get clear on a prayer, something that you would love. And then you can create this beautiful internal pharmacology, these bliss chemicals, this love chemicals. And you can build this energy in your body, the most creative force available to us as humans. And then you can dedicate that to your dream. You can yes. offer that to your prayer. So I call it pleasure prayer, where you're basically mm -hmm. just building the pleasure in your body and using it to pray, which I get could be a little triggering for people who have thought that, well, well, prayer is holy and that's where God is and sex is a sin and that's where the devil is. You're like, one is good and one is bad. Yes, <laughs> and yes. so I actually really love the opportunity to reclaim that energy for ourselves and to 
mm, let go of someone else's story, someone else's conditioning, someone else's shame, and really, the, but what do I believe? And, and, you know, as far as I know from manifesting, and, and I've learned so much from you, it's, it's like the simplest recipe for manifesting is feel good, place the order. Yes. Place the order, feel good, feel good, place the yes. order. And, That's you it. know, getting into your sexual energy is a beautiful, powerful way to feel good. And you can do that on your own. You could do that with a partner. And even to some degree, you can do it in congregations, right? Like you yes. see it, people are in ecstatic, blissful yes. states at Agape. Yes. And, and so it's, it's, there's just such an untapped resource. And really the thing that lights me up is that I feel like if we wanna face the big challenges that we are being faced with in our generation, in our species right now on planet earth, we are going to need to be able to harness this most creative force. Yeah. And so this is the thing that's exciting to me. Can we get lots of people, millions of people in coherence with themselves and each other and holding a collective vision for this species and in these beautiful ecstatic states so here we go <laughs> yeah bravo i mean that that is the work of our time because the mind has been hijacked by so much fear and anxiety and worry and doubt separation guilt shame yeah uh it's been normalized and what we're seeking to do is to normalize the higher frequencies yes so, so you know i do a, a lot around manifestation in which i'll do very similar i'll have people like re-enchant their imagination <gasps> Okay. To, like to, chant to, it. Can you say more about that? What do you mean chant their imagination? No, say re-enchant. Re-enchant re the imagination. To take back the imagination and to imagine like wide swaths of good in every area of your life. Go into the feeling of that all through your body. What does that feel like? And then let go of the picture. Uh-huh. And this let and this normalize that feeling of bliss and ecstasy. And then from that space. You're outside of the known, and then manifestation can, can occur beyond your imagination. Oof. You said earlier that feeling tone is extremely important. Yeah. And, and, and then when you, from time to time, just let go of the pictures, you're no longer constrained by your limited point of view, as wide as it can be. It's still limited because the unknown is unprecedented in your life. But the, but the bliss and the ecstasy and the spiritual and the pleasure is what is what brings the manifestation that takes you beyond yourself. And I love that so much. Thank you yeah. for that reminder of like, yes, the images matter, the picture matters yes, yes. to the degree that we just start the journey. But yes. then yes, we let that construct fall away because nature has infinitely more intelligence than we do. So yes. It, it, it knows it knows the how if you know the what. <laughs> oh yes. The, I love it. I always say you, yeah, your you job know the is what, the what the vibration of the what then the how happens. Because the universe can change anything to match your frequency and your vibration. You mm. know? Now I know you've seen a lot of changes in people based on the work. What what have you what have you noticed along the line? Uh, what are the, the changes that have happened to folks? Mm. That taken on. So I do. We, we're doing some retreats to sort of teach these embodied manifesting tools because it, it's you, you can do it online, but it's nice to do it in person if you can start. And yes. what's been fascinating are the types of people that are drawn to this work, like not your average people that you would think on a sacred sexuality or even a meditation retreat, a guy, a 64 year old man who just sold a defense contracting company, a mm. CIA agent, two um, Navy folks, a mother of 10 people mm. who've never done this type of work before. And one, this man said, um, being here in this container, which was predominantly female, he said, mm -hmm. I have totally transformed the way that I communicate with my wife and my daughters, mm -hmm. because I'm not trying to fix them or it anymore. I can just witness them in a new way. Yes. We had a mid forties cisgendered straight male who came, who was from Miami, a firefighter. And he said <laughs> that he found his energetic hoo-ha, that he found like his feminine hoo-ha. Uh -huh. And then he experienced in breath work what it was like to conceive his unborn daughter and the profundity of carrying that child. And I was like, ladies and gentlemen, this is what the falling and the crumbling of the patriarchy looks like. It is not about <laughs> tearing anything down. It is about letting people viscerally experience the profundity of the divine feminine which is not inherently female and yes. that was a, that was a big one for me it's an energy absolutely mm -hmm. uh, so you've seen a lot you've seen a lot of changes yeah so you like using the term embodied manifesting and i like the word embodiment i like word, i like the word integration i like those words mm -hmm. you know when you say that what, what do you mean yeah so i would say that i've been 
honestly running my business and manifesting from the neck up. Um, mm. You know, and I, I sort of make fun of myself a little bit, but I built a whole business. I made a whole career out of repackaging meditation as a productivity tool, as a performance mm -hmm. tool. And I would do it again if we were in that age again, right? Yeah. If we were in that age of accomplishment and achievement, but we're not anymore. And COVID had a big part to play in that. But also I think just tuning to this different frequency that we're moving into on the planet, one of receptivity, alignment, magnetizing. And so now the name of the game is, is different. It is more embodied. It's not just from the intellect. It's not mm -hmm. just what mm -hmm. problem externally can I solve, but mm -hmm. actually the feminine is more about internal. Like, can I go in and feel my feelings? Can it's like the, the Iliad and the Odyssey with the external journey, the hero's journey, but the heroine's journey is more internal, like going into the underworlds, going into the feeling escapes. And so it feels like now mm. we have an opportunity to really come home to ourselves. And what I, the way I'm teaching this is just taking it really simple where it's like, can you get your head, your heart and your hoo-ha all mm -hmm. in coherence with each mm -hmm. other, mm -hmm. right? And it sounds mm -hmm. simple, but if you've been taught your whole life that your hoo-ha is bad or wrong or <laughs> dirty or shameful, hoo-ha, <laughs> hoo -ha, right? But so it's like, we reclaim that. And then we can realize that that creation energy is what it's, the, it can be both the generator and the magnet for your dream. So, and I'll just speak for myself is that, you know, I was a really powerful manifester and a great manifestation teacher when I was working neck up, like it works, neurochemistry works. This, once you get into your body, it's just a way to supercharge it. It's a way to yes. amplify it because then you have like your heart, right? Which we know the electromagnetic field of the heart is 70 times more powerful than that of the mind. Absolutely. And then the hoo-ha, right? Then you've got a whole dif different cocktail of bliss chemicals. You've got the oxytocin, the norepinephrine, the adrenaline, all available to you to supercharge the manifestation or the dream. So for me, embodiment is taking it out of the intellect, out of the theoretical, and actually feeling it viscerally in your cells. Absolutely. That's, um, I call that at times being a descended master. You know, everybody, descended. You know, yeah. Everybody's always trying to be an ascended master, trying to get away and escape and go to higher frequencies. But at this age, we're trying to be descended masters. We're trying to bring all those higher frequencies, embody them and bring them to earth. We're not trying to escape and go to heaven. We're trying to manifest heaven fully, completely as spiritual beings having a human incarnation. And so I, I say that's descended mastership. Oh, that's so genius. Yeah. I yeah. love that. Like bringing heaven here into the body, into earth. That's and the game. I was studying, that's the game. That's the game. And when I was studying the Vedas, they would always talk about, it's not about a hierarchy. It's not about how high you can go. It's a lowerarchy. Like how deep excited can you get? How close to source energy can you get? How much can this wave remember that it is also the ocean? Yes, that's it. And, and obviously you started to speak about it already. This has changed your life a lot. Yeah. yeah, you've you've yeah. gone from, like you say, the head to the heart, which is which is the the journey everyone has to make. Mm -hmm. and become yeah, I would say it's, I've also worked a lot less. Like I I feel like truly I feel like my magnet is on. Like I'm able to listen to my own desires in a new way, mm -hmm. and because oftentimes I don't I don't know if you found this. Like if you're if you're teaching manifesting, like the number one block I usually hear from folks is I don't know what I want. Mm -hmm. Emily, I get it. I get the manifesting works, but I don't know what I want to manifest. And usually it's like, if we can't really hear or feel our desires for what we want in our life, it's because oftentimes we're divorced from our desires internally and in the body. And so when you reconnect to being able to listen to and honor the desires of your body, then it changes your relationship with your desires of manifestation. And so for myself, I'd say I'm much clearer on my desires. I'm much braver to speak them because I, see, I know that they're not mine, right? That it is nature moving through me, that my desires are divinely inspired. Mm -hmm. And then I would say that I also feel like I'm, I am in fact doing less and accomplishing more because mm -hmm. it is from a place of alignment. It is from a place of magnetism. Like I took a two month sabbatical last year, first time in my whole career I've ever taken two months and, and Ziva had its biggest year ever. We taught more people to meditate last year than we ever have. Mm -hmm. And that felt like a real high five from nature. I feel grateful to be modeling what I'm teaching. You know, like I'm taking a dose of my own medicine and I am letting myself to be a magnet to the dreams instead of going out and trying to bring them like go and get them right I am allowing them to flow to me yeah yeah that, that is the next stage I mean <clears throat> when we look at 
for instance, the law of attraction, I call that a linguistic convenience for the law of radiation. You're actually radiating the quality. And then you come into the law of resonance, where you're actually in frequency with it. And then you come into the law of emergence. That which is already within you begins to emerge because you've become the, the vibrational condition for the emergence. Mm. If you, take, you take an avocado seed, it already contains the avocado tree, but it has to be in the right condition for it to emerge. So when it's in the right condition, it has the right nutrients, sunlight, et cetera, then that little bit of information that's in there, it's, it's vibrating. And then sh roots, shoots, it starts, to, it starts to emerge from within. And what you're teaching, what I'm teaching, what we're teaching is allowing people to really get that it is here and that we become the vibrational conditions for it to emerge. And it looks like we're attracting it, but it's really already here. And we become in the condition for its visibility. Oh, so yeah. beautifully said. Yeah. And, yeah. and if, the thing that it reminds me of is, is that the desire is already there. And I believe you wouldn't even have the desire if it wasn't already on the way to you. Absolutely. And so what we do when we practice pleasure prayer is just that you're, you're conditioning your cells to have a beautiful, positive association with the desire so that when the opportunity comes, because we know it's on the way, we know it's on the way because you have the desire. And then when the opportunity comes, it feels like you're reuniting with a lover instead of being like, oh no, here's my big chance. Right. I, this is going to make it or break it. And then we go into survival and flight or flight. It's like, oh, you're being reunited with a lost love. Right. The desire is the thing itself in incipiency. It's, it's already, it, what you desire is the, is the energetic embryonic state of it. Mm. It comes from the word to sire, actually. And it's already there. And all the stuff that we do is allowing that which is there to be amplified. And as you say, it's, it's a homecoming. Mm. Did you say that desire comes from the, the root to sire? Yes. To seed? Yes. Or, wow. Thank so you for it, that. So the seed already contains an energy. Wow. Yeah, you're, you're, you're getting me enthused. <laughs> it is well enthused, like filled with God, right? Yeah, like, and enthused. these desires are divinely yeah. inspired. It's like it, it's all dancing with each other. Absolutely. And so the other thing that you, you, you said, you're intimating the fact that, you know, instead of just, I'm going to go out and manifest something, you know, you're getting into the feeling tone of it. That's why I teach the vision process, because it's like, our minds are flooded with what we think we want. Often the things we think we want, we've gotten from society. We've gotten it from parental fantasies, religious fantasies, societal fantasies. And as you said earlier, people don't know what they want, mm. but there's something within us that wants to come, come from us. And we mm. have to learn how to listen and ask, you know, what is it here that really wants to express itself beyond what our parents wanted, beyond what our other people want for us, what does our soul want to express? And then, and then something begins to, we become, um, we, we're able to, to reactivate our intuitive faculties and our inner faculty of seeing the invisible, hearing the inaudible. And, and then something begins to dawn upon us. And it's not coming from the world. It's coming mm. from our soul. Yeah. And, and then, then we, have, we, have embodied, we have embodied manifestation. And, and this to me, it feels like why it's so important that people have a meditation practice and yes. a manifesting practice that they both really complement each other so beautifully. And if you skip straight to manifesting, in my experience, without a meditation practice, it's so much harder to hear that whisper from the soul because we're trapped in the addictive longings, right? We yes. think we want those fantasies from the world or, you know, you have to ask a heroin addict what they want. They're like, more heroin, please. I want more heroin, yes. Yeah. Versus if we, if we realize that we are source energy, that we can create that internal pharmacology from a self-sufficient and repeatable way, then it's like the addictions start to fall away. We can discern the difference between the addictive longing and the intuitive desire and that is like you know not all desires are divinely inspired there are right. some that are addictive longings and knowing the difference between the two this requires a level of mastery that i find meditation makes maybe not easy but easier yeah no you're speaking my language that that, that is it with meditation is allowing you to pay attention to what's real 
and not just the um, the thought forms that are moving through your surface mind based on misinterpretation of experiences, trauma, what the world is, is trying to give you or trying to make you. If you buy this, you'll be happy. You smell like this, you'll get the girl, you'll get the guy, whatever the case may be. You know, it's really coming from your soul. Mm. Really from your soul. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, you have, why isn't everyone doing this podcast? <laughs> Tell me about that. What made you start that? Oh, well, first of all, I'm so excited that you're going to be a guest. Thank you for saying yes. And to me, it felt like a beautiful opportunity to have more intimate conversations. Like there's a, the long form conversation. You can really get inside of someone's heart and their soul and, and plant these little seeds, these little ideas. Um, so my mission with the podcast is to help give people access to different types of modalities. Some that are a bit taboo, some mm -hmm. that are a bit... Um, you know, uh, spine tingling, uh, as mm -hmm. it were. And obviously, they're not all going to be for everyone. But to really examine, like, why is this a thing? And I get to bring on brilliant people like yourself and say, hey, when is the moment in your life where you found something so good, so life changing, that you wanted to shout it from the rooftops that you mm -hmm. wanted to say, like, why isn't everyone doing this? Mm -hmm. For me, it was with meditation, and now with sacred sexuality and embodied manifesting. And so I, I'd love to pose that question to you. I mean, we'll save it for the show. But like, do you have an answer to <laughs> that question of like the, a time in your life where you're like whoa this is so good why isn't everyone doing it oh I'm sure you know <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> there's so there's so much I have a as you know a long arc of of how long I've been doing this yeah and at this stage I still am a child I still have childlike wonder yeah I still um have beginner's mind yeah. I still am uh on the always on the edge of a, of a new radical insight that changes my life. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have a, um, I'm not a, um, a, a filing cabinet of information, even though I know a lot, I'm just, I'm just more here, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever the appropriate um, action or thought or talk happens in that mm -hmm. moment, you know, and, and then that energy just uses, uses everything that I think I know, and then gives me more. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah there's a, a lot in here. You're such a living example of like the more present, the bigger the bandwidth in the current moment. It's like the right brain is so online that you can become such a channel for nature to use you as a vessel. And and to me, it feels like, you know, this has one of the, been one of the gifts of meditation for me is that it transitioned me from being a bag of need looking to be fulfilled mm -hmm. and turned me into fulfillment looking for need. Um, but I'm curious in your beginner's mind, um, and in this presence, is there anything, have anything that surprised you as of late? We were like, whoa, I never thought I would try that or do that. I, I'm kind of a big yes to, to, to everything that comes to me. I mean, if it's not destructive, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always surprised that I'll say yes. And it's something I haven't done before or something I haven't done this way before. And I'll say yes anyway. And then the source energy just fills it up and lets me master it in that moment mm. and then it becomes in my body then then I got it you know I, I was thinking about the last time I, I I went to this particular event I just did an event recently where I did um four 90-minute presentations a day for two days and the last time I went there it was eight speakers we all had 90-minute presentations but they wanted me to come back and do all eight all eight spots so when I looked at it on paper, it was like, wait, wait a minute. They want me to come and do what eight people did before. They want me to do all eight presentations for a day. And they said, yes, that's what we want. And I said, okay. <laughs> it, and I'm, I'm getting you, like an image of like, um, you know, the, the Indian gods and goddesses, like the Hindu gods, like eight arms and legs, yeah. eight sides of the head, which is like the divine flowing through you in all directions simultaneously. Yeah, it was, it was at the Gaia sphere and it was beautiful. I mean, for those two, I, I, it was like, it, I'm telling you, Emily, it was like 10 minutes. Wow. I started speaking on the first uh, uh, module because I had to write down the eight modules. They wanted me to write down what I was going to teach. Is that hard? Um, no, it wasn't. It was easier than okay. I thought. I just okay. wrote it down, turned it in, and they said, this is brilliant. Yeah. And I thought to myself, okay, well, how am I going to teach this? <laughs> and then I went, and it just flowed. And next thing I know, it was over. And we hung out, we danced, hugged everybody in the room. 
And uh, but at the time, it was like, how am I going to do eight modules in two days? And then it it, it showed up. The life mm -hmm. life energy showed up for me. Yeah, and you so, knew the what, and nature handled the how, and ended the how. And so now that's in me. That that is now a part of me. That's like, mm -hmm. it's me. It's like you want me to do what? Yeah, sure, I'll do it. Let's let's go for it. You know, obviously, there's got to be med. There has to be meditation. Mm -hmm. You know, there has to be meditation. There has to be right nutrition. There has to be hydration. There has to be rest. You know, you have to have all of those ingredients. Uh, particularly I, I, for you, meditation is my primary go-to. You know, uh, I'd too. say don't don't leave home without it. Do you know. That. Uh, I want to make it as rude to leave your house without meditating as it would be to leave your house without brushing your teeth. It's like that is stinky. You need to handle that. That is not pleasurable for you or anyone near you. You need to go clean that up. <laughs> we, we come from the same track because I tell people just like you have a social contract to wash your hands. Yes. You know, didn't washing your hands didn't start with COVID. You know, <laughs> <laughs> when people were talking about people washing your hands, for I'm saying longer than COVID. <laughs> say, wait a minute, you guys haven't washed your hands before this. <laughs> I'm, I'm scared, <laughs> but you know, we, we have a social contract that when we leave the house, we've showered, we've washed our hands, we've brushed our teeth. We want to have a social contract that we're not leaving our house without some level of contact and integration with source. Yes, the people will just be meeting your un, unresolved stuff. Yes. And you so, feel it if you go to Asia, yeah. if you go to Japan or China, yeah. like where there's temples everywhere on every street corner and there's a level of, of order, there's a level of symmetry, there's a level of um, flow that you can see. And it's because you can tell that even though maybe different denominations, different temples, but everyone is going and connecting to source almost every day before they right. go to work. And it right. changes the frequency and the fabric right. of the society. Yeah, you, you go to these places that, and they have altars in their windows, and you can tell, I mean, there's some, in every culture, there is some fundamentalism around it, but in other spiritual cultures, there's a, there's a real honoring and a real um, connecting with what the altar means. You're not just yes. worshiping an altar, you're actually reading, worshiping the meaning that the altar is, pre uh, uh, altar is presenting to you, so you're actually leaving your home in a feeling of devotion. Yeah. And yeah, since, isn't... since my son Jasper has made many guest appearances on the show so far, <laughs> I'll share that we were at a restaurant in, um, in Austin and there was, it was a Thai restaurant and they had a, a little temple outside in the walkway. And I, on the way up, he's like, what is this? It looked like a little dollhouse or something. And I told him, I was like, this is a temple. This is where you can make offerings, where you can offer blessings, make a prayer. So we had dinner and on the way out, he took his car. It was like a little matchbox car. It was just prized mm. possession. And he offered, I said, do you want to make an offering to the temple? And he took his matchbox car and he put it in the temple. And I said, buddy, would you like to oh. offer a prayer? And he said, he said, you know, dear stars, dear moon, please help to change earth. Please make it more mm. like the outer, like mm. the solar system. And he mm. walked around it three times. I was not instructing him in any of this. It was his left shoulder to the temple, walked around it three times. And then we walked away and I was, I've never been more proud. <laughs> and he left the car. He left the car. <laughs> That's, beautiful. That's beautiful. And then I gave him three cars the next day because I really wanted to like encourage and give him like right. a, a, a positive association with, with like surrendering your preferences to the divine brings you more back. So right. I wanted to act on behalf of nature. <laughs> That's beautiful. So the, the, the final question is, I, I teach often that pain pushes until the vision pulls. Mm. What's pulling you right now? Ooh, I'll tell you, I... I, I had this download and it's this vision and it's, it's absurd. It's wild. And I, I'm like, really nature? Really? Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I judge it a little bit, but I had this download and it's clear as the bell. It's 80,000 people in Dallas Cowboy stadium, holding a collective dream for the species and going into full climactic states together. Fireworks, hopefully Beyonce, Lizzo, you please come and give We have the same dream. Wait, really? I want to fill a stadium of individuals that are more enthusiastic than winning a Super Bowl. Yes. With the enthusiasm of connection to the presence catching a vision of possibility for humanity, feeling into it as if it's already happening. Yes. I, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Great. Let's, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's do agree it. that that's happening. 
It's happening. Done deal. With our collective antenna and manifesting and everyone listening to this, I invite them to hold this vision with us. Appreciate let's envision, let's feel what it would feel like for the fireworks going off to Absolutely. have the amazing Reverend Michael Bernard Beckwith bringing us into these states, us utilizing our pleasure to pray and holding a vision for our planet and the species. And so it is. And Emily Fletcher kicking cosmic keister <laughs> and waking up everyone into the the pleasure bliss zone. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so listen, your podcast, say your name, the podcast again, and tell them where oh, they can find why it. isn't everyone doing this? It's on Spotify, Apple, YouTube. Why isn't everyone doing this? And then we're, if you want to follow Ziva, it's just at Ziva meditation or Ziva meditation.com. That's Z I V A everyone. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, check out my friend, Emily. She's got, she's bringing the good stuff. Oh, I learned it from watching you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for me. spreading it. You. You know, I, 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 I was I was in a stadium years ago and um, I had an awareness as I was sitting looking at 50, 60,000 people. It was at a USC football game and it didn't hit me. Two things hit me. One, that in so many years, most of these people were going to be invisible. They're not going to be on the planet anymore. And then two, it, uh, the source told me that I was going to make a mighty difference on the planet. And it showed me that the people I was touching we're going to touch so many people. Yes. And 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 and, and I've, I'm getting that feedback in my life at this time in history. Yes. Well, I can say that that is true for me. Like truly, you were one of my first manifesting teachers, and it it has it changed me. It changed the way that I relate to nature. It changed the way that I relate to myself. And it's been such an honor and a privilege to get to you know be a beacon of that message to tens of thousands of people over the many the last few years. So thank you. And you're you. doing a great job. Your articulation is magnificent. Mm -hmm. It's accessible. It's enthusiastic. You carry a lot of powerful energy. You're, you're doing good. If you did, I know you don't need to hear that from me, but I you're do. Doing, it you're feels doing so. really good. You're doing really good. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so thank you for being with us on Take Back Your Mind. We will see you on Why Isn't Everyone Doing This? That's right. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Have a beautiful day. Continued blessings to all of you tuning in. Thank you for tuning in to the podcast. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your spreading the word. We always end our particular podcast with a brief meditation. And since Emily and I have been speaking about meditation as a foundational piece for living, you heard me say, don't leave home without it. We both agreed that we want to have a social contract, that we don't leave our homes without making contact with our real nature and our real being through meditation. So I invite you right now to come to a complete stop it's called S-Y-B-D. Sit your butt down. Be still. The three foundational points of meditation are stillness, silence, and solitude. You build up the capacity to be still, silent, and then a fortress of solitude builds within you where you feel connected to source and never alone. Close the outer eyes. Take a breath and perhaps take your shoulders and bring them up to your ears and just kind of release and let your body just relax. Hands on your lap facing upward, thumb and forefinger touching as a sign of transcending your limited perception. And let us together have a, a wonderful intention to wake up to our glorious nature, to be aware of source energy by whatever name we call source energy infinite spirit love beauty intelligence life itself that's our intention to realize our life is an emanation of source energy we bring our attention and we surround our intention until we feel our intention we stop for a moment as if someone were about to tell us something very important. So our, our entire intention and attention is about listening to be free, to catch insight. And we always enter in 
with beginner's mind. This is the first time we've ever meditated. Let us be still with this intention to wake up. If the mind wanders, come back to your intention. Embrace the breath because, <clears throat> because the breath is happening presently. Be still. You're aware at this precise moment, perhaps thousands of people are sitting in this field of coherence around an intention to wake up to our glorious nature. We're not alone. We hear the vibration of be still and know that the I am God is in the midst of us. It is from the depth of silence and stillness in inner solitude that we give thanks and lift our attitude into the altitude of gratitude that we may magnetize into our life the highest and best that life has to offer through the sheer power of gratefulness and thankfulness. Grateful to be alive, awake and aware, grateful that we exist at all. All of this is occurring in this moment and we feel grateful that all of our needs are met and we allow it to be so. And so it is. Peace and blessings, everyone. Continue to practice some level of meditation every single day. Let your friends know about the podcast, Take Back Your Mind. Subscribe to it if you haven't done so already. Have a bright day. As always, presently, we have two sponsors to Take Back Your Mind podcast. One is Adapta Zen. The sponsor is Neutralize. Adapta Zen is an aspect of Neutralize. We have superfood greens, and we have the vitamin D3, K2. The immune system is very important. And the energy circuits of your body are very important to be able to carry more cosmic energy. So you want to have your spiritual practice that keeps you in homeostasis, not acidic, but your pH balance is wonderful. And then you want to have right supplementation to assist in that process. Go to Nutrarise.com, tap on Adaptazen, and get your bundle. The other sponsor is always the Agape International Spiritual Center now and in going into its 37th year, go to agapelive.com. There you'll find a plethora of ways to tap into the community. You can tap into it every Sunday for our way of meditation service. 
Our second service of the day is at 8.30 a.m. for meditation, 9 o'clock a.m. for the Worship Celebration Fellowship service. The third service, of course, is 11 a.m. meditation, 11.30 fellowship service. Go to the website, agapelive.com. There are daily meditations, daily prayer times. So much is happening in this community. Those are our two sponsors that we give thanks for. Have a bright day. Your time is very valuable, so I want to thank you for lending us your ear and participating in taking back your mind. If you want to submit a question for the question of the week, please submit it to podcast at michaelbeckwith.com. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, please submit a review and let us know your thoughts. Stay on top of current episodes by subscribing to the podcast so that you'll receive alerts and not miss one single episode. And feel free to share this podcast with all of your friends and family. And until we meet again, take back your mind and you will take back your life. Peace and blessings.